الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين أبدا السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته once again and welcome to the second session on our discussion on the verse of light which is found in verse number 35 of Surah An-Nur we will inshallah get started today with a summary of what we covered last week and then we want to look at the second segment of the verse um, which we are which we are studying at the moment uh, as always uh, whenever you do have a question please do feel free even whilst i'm speaking um, to put a message in the chat or to use the question um, box to put your message and i'll try to tra- take a break and answer your questions the main point that uh, we want to make over here is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to explain something to us in this verse and in order to explain it to us he is using a method a parable a comparison an analogy and there are a number of reasons for why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses parables in the quran examples in the quran uh, one of the reasons of course is so that that concept which is very difficult to understand which is a intellectual concept which is a higher truth or a higher reality should become accessible should become understandable to most human beings and human beings are very tangible human beings are very tangible in their perception or very sensorial shall we say um, in their perception and therefore allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes takes that which is ma'qul that which is intellected and tries to make it mahsus that which is uh, that that which can be perceived by our senses so that most people are able to understand this reality but the other reason as well for having parables in the quran is so that people who are keen people who want to put that effort are able to take that parable and able to understand higher truths and higher realities they're able to climb up the levels of understanding by using that parable and inshallah we will try to do that uh, here as well now coming to the summary um, the one thing i want to once again remind ourselves is that um, there are three important pillars to any parable to any analogy to any comparison if you remember from last week the first is the item which is being compared and the second is that which it is being compared to and the third one which we have to be able to zone into is the reason for the comparison so for example when you say that a scholar is like an ocean the scholar is being compared is being compared to the ocean and the reason for the comparison could be the depth okay so whenever we look at a parable in the quran what has to be first and foremost very clear for us is one what is being compared to what is it being compared to and three what is it that this thing what feature does this thing have that we also need to understand about that which is being compared okay? so we'll keep that in mind for today inshallah we started the verse by looking at allahu nuru samawati wal ard Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the light of all creation. And this has been interpreted in a number of different ways by the mufassirin. Um, one of the ways, of course, it has been interpreted is here, nur means hidayah. Allah is the hadi. He is the guide of the entire universe, of the heavens and the earth. The second interpretation given to nur is that he is the source of light all the light that we see in the sky and on the earth by which we are able to see things 
by which we're able to perceive the environment around us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has created that light. But we were dwelling on a deeper meaning. And in order to understand that deeper meaning, we first had to look at the meaning of the word light. You know, the word light um, can refer to physical light, as we said um, last week. But we also speak about the light in the heart. We also speak about the light in Barzakh. We also speak about light in the higher realms. There, it is not in the form of photons or waves or this physical light. So what does the word light mean? And we say that there is in the Arabic language, and here's a side point, which I think would be very beneficial for those who are students of the Quran. It actually, this point, even though I'm mentioning it as a side point, it is actually one of the fundamental foundations of Tafsir al-Mizan, of Allama Tabataba'i's approach to doing Tafsir of the Qur'an. Uh, perhaps the most foundational concept um, in what makes al-Mizan, al-Mizan. And that is that in the Arabic language, these words have a root meaning. And they are actually postulated. These words are created for their root meanings. Then we start using them in their common meanings. Okay? And we gave some examples last week. Okay? For example, mizan, the root meaning is that it is a tool for measurement. The common meaning of it, of course, is that it is a balanced scale, for example. But the balanced scale is not the actual meaning of mizan. It is just an example of mizan, if I can put it that way. Well, the physical light that we see is not the meaning of nur. It is an example of nur. But what is the real meaning of nur? What is the root meaning of nur for which this word was created, for which this word was postulated by uh, the Arabic-speaking people? And they say that the word nur actually means that which is apparent for itself, self-apparent, sorry, which is self-evident, doesn't require anything to make it evident. It also makes other things apparent, visible um, to us, evident to us. Okay? And of course, in the physical world, the best example of that is the physical light. Um, it is self-apparent and it makes other things apparent for us as well. But that's not the only meaning of, of nur. So with that root word, then we say, well, what does it mean? And this is important because there is a school of thought that is going to say that, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nur, um, and we don't understand what that nur means. Hmm? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, is... Uh, Rahman, and we don't know what Rahman actually means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, for example, you take any of the names of Allah, he's Hay, he is ever living, but we don't actually know what Hay or ever living means. The, 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 the approach that we take in our school of thought is to say, no, we can understand. If we could not understand, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have communicated it to us. Clearly, if he is communicating it to us, there is something that he wants us to understand. He wants us to take meaning from it. He wants us to uh, take such meaning that we're able to change our lives by it. Now, that only happens if we can have some understanding of what we are being told. Allah is telling us, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Well, clearly there is some meaning of light that we can understand and then we can predicate that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And the meaning that we have to understand there is not the common meaning, but the root meaning. And the root meaning of nur is So what does it mean when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-evident and makes other things evident? That's the question that really is at the heart of understanding this particular uh, a verse of the Qur'an or this segment 
And uh, last week we looked at uh, two meanings of it. One is that um, he is the creator of the entire universe, meaning that um, he himself exists uh, by himself, does not need anyone to bring him into existence. And number two, he brings other things into existence. Okay, he, you know, when things come into existence, then they become apparent. Therefore, when we say that he makes other things apparent, it means, well, first he brings them into existence and then they become apparent. Very similar to the meaning of Qayyum, self-subsisting, that he does not rely upon anyone for his existence or his perfections and everything relies upon him for his, their existence and for their perfections. That is one meaning. The second meaning that we looked at last week, <clears throat> which was a little bit different from what we have come to think, what we have come to expect, what we have come to understand, and that is that he is the most apparent thing in the universe. He is the apparent, right? He is the most apparent thing. And what was difficult to, of course, comprehend there is the idea that he does not need anything to make him apparent. Rather, it is he who makes other things apparent for us. It is by knowing him that we're able to understand other things. By knowing him, we understand his prophet. By knowing him, we understand his hujja. By knowing him, we understand his creation. And we delved to some extent on this idea, but not too much on it either. The, the example that we gave is to say that, look, um, there are two ways of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is to know him directly, and the other way is to know him through his creation. And we said, yes, both are valid ways of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, for most people, it's not possible to know Allah except through his ayat, except through his signs, except through his manifestations, except through his creation. Through his creation, we come to know him. And the example that some of the scholars use for this is to say that think of his creation as a mirror, a mirror that reflects and manifests the perfection of Allah, the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think of these ayat, these signs as mirrors. They have no image of their own. And any image that you see in them does not belong to the mirror, doesn't belong to that mountain, doesn't belong to that plant, doesn't belong to, for example, the ocean. It is just reflecting the glory, the perfection, the beauty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you just stay with me on that analogy of the mirror, is that you will know that the mirror can only reflect in accordance to its capacity. Depending on how clear it is, how large it is, what direction it faces, if we use that example, to that extent it is able to reflect, right? And therefore there are some ayat which are smaller signs and some ayat which are bigger signs. But all these signs have their limitations. They can only reflect in accordance to their capacity. And therefore, as much as we try to know God through his creation, it will be a limited understanding. And there is, of course, that ability to know God directly through direct experience and then to understand his creation through that. Now, we will keep it to that, inshallah. Um, for this particular part of the discussion, we want to move on to the second part of the tafsir. And the second part is um, we're going to parse it. We're going to break it down. And we're first going to just look at the Arabic and we're going to look at the parable itself. We're looking at the example itself. Now, whenever we study the Quran, it's very important before we start our contemplation, before we start our reflection, to have a crystal clear understanding of the words, the expressions, and the meaning of the verse. 
if we jump that step without having a clear understanding of what the verse is trying to say, there is no doubt in my mind that our reflection is also going to be a flawed reflection. It will be a deficient reflection. So it's very important when we're studying the Quran to put that initial effort. What do these words mean? What does this sentence mean? What is the clear meaning of this sentence? Once that clarity is achieved, then we are in a good position to begin tadabbur and contemplation. So let's start with that. And I hope that, inshallah, you will help me with that. Mathalu nurihi, the parable of his light, the example of his nur, is ka, ka is like, like what kamishkatin, is like a niche, fiha in that niche, not just a niche by itself. We're going to explain what the word niche means over here. But not just the niche by itself. The niche in which there is a misbah. Okay. Now let's start a, a lantern or a lamp. So let's start with mishkat. Today we don't have mishkat in our house, and our homes. So this part of the parable is not clear for us. But if we were to go back a few hundred years, you know, every home, if you look in the wall or even in a masjid, in the walls, they had crevices, they had niches, they had um, a, a, a kind of a space carved out in the wall um, to be able to keep the lanterns in there. So where would you keep the lantern in your home? You would keep it in that crevice in the wall, in that niche in the wall. In the masjid as well, you would keep it in that niche inside the wall okay and the misbah is not just a lamp it is a lantern um some of you may have seen this type of a lantern um it burns oil uh using a wick and the wick you put it on fire it is covered by a glass globe and there is a way to carry it as well that's a misbah the plural of misbah is masabih Sometimes we refer to the Ahlul Bayt as Masabihul Huda. You are the lanterns of guidance. Okay. All right. So here's the parable. The parable begins by telling us the example of the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a niche that has a lantern, an oil lantern in it. Now, here's my question uh, to start us, is what do you think was the purpose of having a mishkat, of having a niche in the home? Wouldn't they just have hung the lantern in the middle of the room or kept it on a table? Why would they want to put it into a niche, into a space, into this kind of a hole? in the wall <clears throat> okay one is safety so safety uh from <clears throat> uh safety from from falling down for example okay so a place to keep the lantern so it's not coming in the way we don't kick it we don't push it it doesn't fall down uh, possibly that that was uh, another reason for for keeping it uh, in a place which is away from the you know where where people are mostly walking <clears throat> okay dedicated space that maximizes the light so yes it does kind of force the light into a particular direction um and uh, you know it's a place from which the light shines and if you, for example, were to make three, four niches in the room and place the lanterns properly in there, you might be able to get um, consistent lighting in the house uh, to reflect and spread the light. Um, yes, it provides height through which you can have more light emanating from that particular height instead of putting it in the ground. Um, out of draft, and uh, that's a very important point. Um, that's one of the main reasons for why they actually had a niche in the home or in the mosque or in any building is because when you have the wind blowing at the flame, 
even if you have, for those who have seen that, even if you have a glass globe around it, it still causes the flame to, you know, to, to move. Um, it makes it unstable. It makes the light intensify and then become dim and intensify and become dim again. So to keep it away from the wind, to keep it away from the draft, to keep it away from these changes, um, it was put in a niche. So the niche was there for the protection of the flame. It was there to keep a consistent amount of light. It was there to provide a, um, you know, a consistent amount of intensity within the room when the lantern was turned on. So let's keep that in mind because this is the reason for the example, right? This is the reason for why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this example. And uh, because we are no longer living in that kind of an environment, we have to spend some time thinking about it. Okay, there was a question that I had skipped and I just want to answer that if Noor was Hidayat, then why use the word Noor and not Hidayah? So one could say that, you know, the word Noor, again, is the, the use of that which is Mahsus, that which is perceptible by our senses, to describe that which is Ma'qul, that which is a concept that the mind understands. Uh, for a lot of people, it'd be easier to understand and say, well, the Qur'an is Nur. The Qur'an calls itself Nur. Um, the Prophet is called Nur as well, for example. It means that just the way um, you know, light were to guide you in darkness and shows you the path when there is confusion, the same way the Qur'an and the Prophet also show you the path when there is uh, confusion it's kind of easier for us to understand that concept when this example of light is, is being used. Okay, uh, continuing. So the parable continues. It's actually a lengthy parable. So we're going to parse in each and every part of the parable. Al-Misbahu, that lantern. Well, what about that lantern? What are some of the features of that lantern? Fi zujajatin is in a zujaja. What is a zujaja? So in the lantern, you'll have noticed, um, if you picture it right now, um, there is, of course, the base which contains the oil. And then there is a wick that goes from the base up to the top. Um, and it comes out. And then there is the fire around the wick. And then around the, the fire, there is a glass globe that normally covers it from the bottom all the way to a particular height at the top. Okay? And then there might be other structures around that glass. There'll be some metal covering around that glass um, to provide it protection and to be able to carry it and to keep it stable. But that glass globe, or well, that glass globe is called a zujaja. Al-Misbahu, that lantern, that lamp, that flame, is in a glass globe. Fi zujajatin. Well, what about that glass globe? As zujajatu, that globe, ka'annaha, as if it is kawkabun. Kawkab is normally used to refer to a celestial body. Um, if you remember in the story of Yusuf, Yusuf comes to his father after seeing the dream. And he says, Ya Abati, my dear father, inni ra'aytu, I saw ahada ashara kawkaban, 11 celestial bodies or 11 stars. Washamsa wal qamara ra'aytuhum li sajideen. I saw the sun and I saw the moon, I saw them prostrating towards me. So kawkab is a celestial body, but in particular refers to a star. Okay. Kawkabun durriyun, durri meaning glittering, shining, brightly shining star, okay? So now we're being told a little more about this lantern. First, we were told about where it's situated. Now we're being told more about the lantern itself. Number one, there is a glass globe around it. And secondly, the glass globe is shining as if it is a glittering star. Now, a few questions for you. Um, what do you think was the purpose of having a zujaja, of having that globe around the flame? Uh, 
Okay, one is obvious. It is to protect the flame, especially from the drafts and from the wind that uh, comes towards it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also already mentioned the uh, mishkat, the, the niche itself for protection. So let's think about other reasons for why a, uh, you know, a glass covering was put around the flame. <clears throat> it brightens the light. Um, yes, it uh, uh, has the ability to brighten the light. It causes the light to shine even greater. Um, that's true. Uh, safety for others, so others don't directly touch the light. Though one could argue the globe becomes quite hot as well. Uh, to protect people handling the lantern, true. Um, to, to, to protect them from accidentally touching the flame or something else, accidentally touching the flame and catching uh, on fire. So that's true. Um, transparency, yes, provides some clarity um, into, into the light. But there's actually a very important uh, feature, a very important reason for why they used to keep it in this, in, in this particular shape, for example. So one of the things it does actually is that it does regulate the flow of air from the bottom to the top. And when it regulates the flow of air, it keeps it uh, the, the flame at a consistent flame. And it allows that flame to grow. It allows that flame to be stable. It allows that flame to continue shining and allows that uh, flame to remain at the same intensity. Okay, that's a very important feature of why that is used. And Mufassirin of the Quran have actually zoned into that feature and said that is the main reason for the comparison. The globe itself provides, uh, regulates the flow of air from the bottom to the top, and that keeps the flame a stable, brightly shining flame. And therefore, you've got the uh, a second parable, um, which is, you know, the star itself. And one of the features of the star um, that I'll just point out for you right now is that not only is it shining, but one of the things you see about the star itself is that it's stable. It's shining with stability. It's there in its place, okay? It's not, for example, turning on and off. It is not changing in intensity. It is stable, okay? All right. Uh, yes, the initial reference does a question uh, to the lantern be inclusive of the globe. Yes, it is. Um, but we're just being told about how this particular lantern is being made. And in particular here, it seems that when the verse speaks about the misbah, speaks about the lamp or the lantern, um, it is actually zoning into one part of the misbah. And that's important in this example. So thank you for that question. It's actually zoning into the flame. It's zoning into the fire. It's zoning into the source of light. It's zoning into the light. The misbah represents the light. Okay. The light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being compared to the light of a lamp. Where is that light? Number one, it is protected by a niche. Number two, it is in a fizujajatin. It is in a uh, globe. Okay, so very good question. So when the Quran speaks about the misbah, the focus of the misbah is the light. And that's why Allah says, al misbah fi zujajat. That light, of course, it says lamp, but the meaning there is the light is in a globe meaning it is regulated, it is given a place to reside, it is given a place of safety by that globe. Okay? It fills that globe with light. Very important. The result of that is that that globe, it shines in a very stable, consistent, prolonged manner, like what? Like a brightly shining star. 
يُقَدُ مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ Now, this particular lantern or light which is shining brightly, what is the source of its energy? What is the source of its flame? Well, it is lit from a tree. Well, what kind of tree? Mubarak. Mubarak meaning blessed. Whenever you have something whose khair is kathir, whose goodness is abundant, whose goodness is established, especially something small from which a lot of goodness comes, they call it mubarak, for example, or something, anything, small or big, from which a lot of goodness emanates, consistently emanates, that is called mubaraka. This tree is mubarak. Goodness flows from it. Zaytunatin, olive tree. Okay, so just a little bit of uh, Arabic over here. Zaytun is olive, and zayt, zayt is the oil that comes from olive or olive tree. Okay, so yuqadu min shajaratin. This fire is being given energy. It is burning from a tree, meaning its oil comes from a tree which is blessed and a tree which is an olive tree. Question over here. Why of all the oils does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention olive oil and the olive tree? In that area they had olives. True, that area they had olives. Um, though the best of olives uh, didn't come immediately from that area. It came from the area known as the Shamat, the Sham area, which is present day, for example, Syria, uh, occupied Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, all that area um, was called Sham. Best of olive trees came from there. Um, but yes, one of the sources of their oil was olive. It had an ability to burn for longer, perhaps. It also had an ability uh, to burn for longer. <clears throat> One of the reasons why the Mufassirin of the Qur'an mentioned that the example of olive was used and olive oil, it's because in that time of all the oils, the oil that burned the cleanest, the oil that was the cleanest, the oil that was the clearest, the oil that was normally the purest of oils was the oil from the olive tree or from the olive uh, fruit itself. Okay, so. مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية. It says neither eastern nor western, meaning this tree, this shajara, which is mubarak, which is an olive tree. This tree is neither eastern nor western. What does that mean? It's neither eastern nor western. Now, of course, the mufassirin of the Quran have uh, explain this in different ways, but I'll give you the explanation that, for example, scholars like Ayatollah Nasser Makarim, Ayatollah Jawadi, Ayatollah uh, 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 Alama, the Tabatabai have given, is to say that um, you know, think about a um, a farm or think about a um, uh, a garden. Okay, in the garden, besides your olive tree, you have other trees. <clears throat> And besides, you know, for example, in, in, in the, the olive tree um, could be at the edge of the garden where you have walls and these walls provide shade. So, you know, you could have, for example, an olive tree in the middle of the garden or you could have it at the edge of the garden. Well, what happens is when it's at the edge of the garden, it gets, for example, more sunlight in the morning, may not get enough sunlight in the evening. Or, for example, if it's on the other edge, it gets more sunlight in the evening, not enough sunlight in the morning. No, this tree is in the middle of the garden. Or it's in a place where it gets equal sunlight. Equal sunlight from the east and equal sunlight from the west as well. It's not covered by other trees that at certain times, certain areas get more sunlight and certain areas get less sunlight. Each area of this tree gets equal sunlight. Now, that was very, very important, of course. 
um, in, in the fruit that would, that would come out from the olive tree, in the fruit that was produced by the olive tree, um, it would make a difference to it. So just imagine a fruit, for example, that gets more sunlight from one side and less sunlight from the other side. How would it change that? So when the verse is لا شرقية ولا غربية, neither to the east nor to the west, it means that it neither inclines more towards one side so that it gets more sun from one side, nor does it incline more towards the other side so that it gets more sun from the um, other side. And of course, a result of that is that it would be straight. It would not bend, as somebody has pointed out. So here's a question for you. Um, if it gets more sun on one side and less on the other side, how does that change the quality of the olive or the olive oil? Okay, best quality. Okay, so equal quality. Okay, quality is not consistent. Okay, consistency. So what will that change in the in the olive oil itself? So the idea there is that when you have exactly not pure, not pure. When you have more sun on one side and less on the other side, um, one side will become ripe whilst the other side is not as ripe. One side may actually become more rotten and the other side is still not ready, for example, um, to be plucked. Um, and as a result, when you do make olive oil from it, um, it is not going to be a very pure olive oil. It is going to have impurities inside it. And even when you burn it, it is going to give you a little bit of smoke as well when you're burning it. So the whole point being made by this particular segment of the parable is that, number one, the oil is pure. Number two, it has been also nurtured and farmed in a way that it maintains its purity and its consistency. And number three, there is no impurity in the source of the flame. If there's no impurity in the source of the flame, that means even when the flame burns, it burns pure. It does not give out smoke, for example. It does not give out things which um, affect people uh, negatively. To the extent the verse goes and says, يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْهُ نَارٌ Whose oil almost lights up, though fire should not touch it. It's so pure. It is so clean. It is so intense. It is so concentrated, the oil, that, you know, sometimes you would almost feel that even without needing to put the initial flame to it, uh, it can light up, right? One of the examples that Ayatollah Jawadi gave in his dars, he said that, uh, you know, when sometimes you go to a gas station and you're told not to smoke because you're told that, you know, the <clears throat> uh, flame or the, not the flame, but the gasoline is so flammable, it is so intense or concentrated that sometimes even with smoke or even if, for example, um, a little bit of a flame um, is at a distance, it still may catch on, still may catch on fire. Well, that's the idea being conveyed over here, okay? It is so pure, so concentrate, that even just the hint of a flame can inflame it, can make it light up, um, okay? Now, so far, alhamdulillah, we've been able to look at the parable itself. And there are important points being conveyed to us. Number one, this flame sits in a place where it is protected. Number two, it sits in a place where it is regulated. And number three, it is powered, it is energized by a source that is pure, protected, regulated, and pure. Okay? Now, We've seen, um, we've seen the parable itself. We understand what it is being compared to. Yes? 
We also see the reason for the comparison. The reason for the comparison is that whatever is being compared, we're told that that thing, we want to be told that that thing is also protected, that thing is also regulated and managed, that thing is also what? It is also uh, um, pure as well. But the question is, what is that thing? And obviously, if you remember, the second segment of the verse started with Mathalu Nurihi, the example of his light. Now, of course, the light is a very general concept. What exactly is it referring to over here? What is that thing which is difficult for us to understand, which is hard for us to understand, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now has to give us a mathal and say, Mathalu nurihi, the example of his light. Well, what is that thing that Allah wants to um, explain to us? This verse seems to be another beautiful divine reference and praise of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam. So um, that is possible, Brother Muhammad, if especially we look at the verses that come after that, which we won't get the time to look at during our session. But if we look at those verses that come afterwards, fi buyutin adinallahu an turfa'a, in houses where Allah has allowed that his name um, be raised in those houses, we have clear a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he says these houses are the houses of the Anbiya, the houses of the prophets of God, meaning you will find this light, you will find this mishkat, you will find this misbah in those houses which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for his name to be remembered in those houses. He said those are the houses of who? Those are the houses of the prophets. And the house of Ali is also a part of those houses as well. So certainly it is. But the question now here is, Allah is talking about this light. What is this light referring to? Right. So the first point that Alama Tabatabai makes over here, he says that, look, it's important to understand that the light being referenced in this segment is a bit different from the light being referenced in where? In the first segment. What was the first segment? The first segment was Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. There it is speaking to a bit of a different reality. The second segment, Mathalu Nurihi, the example of his light, is referring to a different segment as well. You see, that light in the first part of the verse, this is important to understand, is the general light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that light which lights up the heavens and the earth. It gives existence to them. It makes those things apparent for us. Otherwise, they would not have been apparent for us. Okay? And that is a light that touches everything, that is everywhere. But in the second part of the verse, it's not referring to that general light. It is now referring to a very specific light, right? It's referring to a very particular type of light. How do we know it's referring to a particular type of light? Alama says, look at the end of the verse. In the end of the verse, Allah says, Allah guides whomever he wills to his light. So not everybody has that light. Allah guides to that light, to that nur, to that reality, whomsoever he wills. Okay? So that's a very particular type of light. The example we can give over here is we know that Allah has uh, a compassion, a rahmah that is for all of existence. There he is, Rahman. And then he is a rahmah which is for particular uh, believers in particular. There he is, Rahim. There is a nur that encompasses everything. And there is a nur, Yahdillahu li nurihi man yasha. God guides to his light, whomsoever he wills. This is now a specific light. Okay? The question, of course, is, what is that specific light? 
Mathalu nurihi, the example of his light, to which Yahdi Lahuli Nurihi Mayesha, he guides to his light whomsoever he wills. This light is a general concept. What does it look like in the world around? What exactly should we put our finger on and say, this is what it is referring to? And here you find the Mufassirin of the Quran have differing opinions. And some have kept it very, very general and said, well, you know, it is a general concept which can have many different instances. And some have come in and said, no, it's referring to one thing in particular. Okay? One of the tafasirs of light is the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Mathalu nurihi, the example of his light. A mathalu nabiyihi, the example of his prophet is so and so. Allah even talks about the Prophet in the Quran as being light. Inna arsalnaka shahidan surat ahzab wa mubashiran wa nadhira wa da'iyan ila Allahi bi idnihi wa sirajan munira. And a person who calls people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his permission and a sirajan munira, a lamp which is illuminated. So some have said this refers to the Holy Prophet. Some have said no, this refers to the Quran. A mathalu nurihi, mathalul Quran. The example of the Quran is that it is like so and so and so and so. And Allah, of course, refers to the Quran as nur as well, as light as well. So some have said it refers to Quran. And some have said it refers to Iman in the heart of the believer, right? The Iman that is there in the heart, in the Qalb of a believer, this is the Nur. Mathalu Nurihi, the light of Allah that he shines in the heart of a believer is like, and then the parable comes forth. Here's my question to you, is that whether we say it refers to the Holy Prophet, whether we say it refers to the Quran, whether we say it refers to Iman, what do we have to do? if we want to explain it. What is a very important step now that we have looked at the parable, we have understood the meaning of the parable, what are the important features of the parable, we now are putting our finger on one thing in particular, what do we, be, what do we have to be able to do over here? What's the next step of the contemplation? Ahsantum. Check if it means the specifications of the parable. Not to check if it meets the specifications of the parable, uh, but in that same line to say, okay, if it refers to the Holy Prophet, then what is the Mishkat? What is the Zujaja? What is, for example, um, you know, the, the Shajaratum Mubarakah. What does it mean when it says the Prophet is La Sharqiya wa La Gharbiya? The same with the Quran. What does it mean that this Quran is in a Mishkat? This mish and then this Misbah has a Zujaja. This Quran is La Sharqiya wa La Gharbiya. Neither Eastern nor is it Western. What does it mean when it says that it is Yakadu Zaytuha Yudi'u? It's uh, oil is going to burn even if a flame does not touch it. We have to explain that. Okay? So what we want to do, of course, is not to explain it for all three of them, but in the five or ten minutes that is left, I just want to explain it for one of them. And uh, I want to explain it for the last one, because that seems to be one of the most prominent tafasirs of this verse of the Qur'an. And somebody asked, is there an interpretation of this verse from any of our imams? Yes, we have a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to interpret this verse. Um, the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt explain it. One hadith that I have seen explain it as hidayah, as guidance. And iman is also a part of hidayah and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, inshallah, one day what's important is for us to be able to speak about 
how do we treat a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam when they are explaining for us verses of the Qur'an? You see, sometimes when we come across a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt and the hadith says, this is the meaning of the verse, we sometimes think to ourselves that this is the only meaning of the verse and there is no other meaning of the verse. This verse is limited to this hadith, the interpretation given in this hadith. And what some one day perhaps we can explain is that sometimes the Ahlul Bayt are giving us one meaning of it, one example of it, one extension of it. See, verses of the Qur'an, we know they are alive. And in every era, they take on new meaning. In every era, they give new meaning. They are a hadith to this effect. And therefore, even the hadith says that if it were to stop giving new meaning, then it would be a book that was revealed for one time and not meant for another time. Okay? So the Ahlul Bayt salam, sometimes are giving us one meaning. They're giving us one understanding, one example of it. But sometimes the verse is not limited to that. Okay? They're teaching us how to think about that verse, not just to limit our understanding to what they have given us. Sometimes, yes, the verse is very specific and limited to the interpretation given to us by the Ahlul Bayt. But in many cases there, the Ahlul Bayt are teaching us how to think about that particular verse. Okay, so if that's the case, I want to look at the table now on the next uh, page. And... Uh, <clears throat> Let's begin the mapping. This is what we call now the mapping of the example to the parable. Okay. Well, the example first begins by drawing our attention to a lantern, um, to a flame, to a source of light. And the thing that is being compared is our iman, the iman that resides in our heart. Okay? It's a very apt comparison. The example of his light, the light that Allah puts in the heart of a believer, um, which is Iman in the heart of a believer. Iman is given the parable of light. And the question we have to ask over here is, how is Iman light? Well, what does light do? Light gives us guidance in darkness. It illuminates the path for us. It makes clear what path we should take. Then, of course, it is up to us to take that path. But in the darkness of the night, when you have a lamp with you, it will uh, illuminate the path. It will show you where there are hurdles, where they are, there is harm, and where there is safety. Well, that is the role of Iman in the life of a believer. When a believer has Iman in his heart, it illuminates um, his life for him, the choices that he has in his life, what he should do and what he should not do. If you notice in our lives, many a times decisions are hard to make, not because we don't have enough information. Sometimes we have a lot of information. Yet the path is not clear for us. It's not because we don't have the information. Sometimes it is because our own priorities are not clear for us. What is more important for me and what is less important for me? Or sometimes even if our priorities are clear for us, we don't have the courage, the strength, the resolve to be able to make that decision. And that's where Iman lights up the path for us. Iman puts our priorities into place for us. And when those priorities are in place, then it's easy for us to see what is going to be beneficial for us and what decision is going to be harmful for us. When we have that courage that comes with Iman, then certain decisions which were previously difficult to make, now clearly they are decisions which have become easier for us to make. So Iman is like light in the life of a believer. This light is in a mishkat, it is in a niche. 
in a crevice. And this mishkat is referring to the sadr, the chest of a believer. Now, obviously, the heart is in the chest and iman is in the heart, but it's not referring to the physical chest of the believer. Okay? The sadr um, in, in the Quran, for example, Allah tells the Holy Prophet, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Have we not expanded your chest for you? Okay. Or, for example, the first Imam says, riasa, the most important tool of leadership is what? Si'atu sadr, having an expansive chest. Here, sadr um, refers to a person's knowledge, his view, his vision, his understanding, his character. Okay. This iman resides in this sadr, resides in this chest, resides in what? It resides in knowledge. It resides in understanding. It resides in good character. You know, we say that the purpose of the mishkat was to do what? It was to protect the flame. You will notice that whenever we have doubt and confusion, when it comes to faith, and we are not sure about certain aspects of the faith. And I, and I mentioned this to a number of our younger brothers and sisters when I speak to them. I say that, you know, if your understanding of Islam, if your Iman will just be based on emotions, it'll just be based in rituals, it'll just be based in identity, and it will not be based in understanding and knowledge, then you will find that when doubts and confusions and um, uh, you know the, the, these emerging ideas come, you will be confused. Your faith will go into doubt. The only thing that really can protect faith is knowledge, ilm, and understanding, ma'rifa, and character, truth-seeking character, for example. And therefore, whenever we have doubts, if we have clear fundamental principles that we understand during moments of doubt, we go back to that rational understanding. Well, why do I believe in God? Well, this is the rational understanding. Why do I believe that God is just? Well, because of this, 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 this reason. Right? Why do I believe that the Quran is divine revelation? Because of this, 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 this reason. In moments of doubt, if I have these pillars, if I have this mishkat, if I have this protective covering of knowledge, then I will be able to overcome it. Then the blowing wind is not going to blow my flame away. The only thing that protects it is what? Is ilm, is ma'rifa. Okay? And then it says that it is as if it is fi zujajatin, that lantern is in a glass globe. And that glass globe, according to Mufassirin, like Ayatollah Nasser Makarim Shirazi, refers to the qalb, the heart of a believer. Iman resides not, for example, in the books, does not reside in lectures, does not reside in the environment around us, does not even reside in places of worship. Iman resides in the qalb, in the heart of a mu'min. And not only does it reside in the heart of a mu'min, it is protected in the heart of a mu'min, it is regulated in the heart of a mu'min. Remember we said the most important purpose of having a glass globe was what? The most important purpose of having a glass globe was that it regulates the flame. Well, the qalb of a mu'min has characteristics which regulate iman. The most important characteristic, and this is important. This is important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, Allah puts his light not in any place. He puts his light in a certain heart. Okay? He puts his light in a certain globe. Okay? And therefore, the heart has to have certain characteristics. It has to have the ability to accept, to house, Iman to house that light and to regulate it as well. And that means that that heart is a heart that is truth-seeking, truth-accepting, 
truth submitting it has to have those qualities and that's how it regulates the truth that's how it regulates the iman and the of course explanation continues la sharqiyatin wa la gharbiya um just very quickly i will point out as we're running out of time is that well just as that lamp is fueled by a pure source of energy the iman of a believer is also fueled by a very pure source of energy that is neither easternly or westerly here easterly or westerly also means it is not immoderate it is in moderation there's no ifrat or tafrid there's no excess over here and that source of guidance which is pure which is siratul mustaqim which is the middle path is referring to divine revelation and referring to the quran it is fueled by the quran the way the quran can fuel iman in the heart turn the flame of iman on in the heart it doesn't need even a flame from the outside to burn it it is almost ready to burn by itself in the heart it doesn't need external ideologies it doesn't need sometimes external impetus that is how the quran is able to fuel and burn the light of iman in the heart of the believer i will pause over here as the time has come to an end but i'll take the time now to <clears throat> respond to some of the questions that have um, arisen the question is <clears throat> what about taqwa referred to as libas and protection uh, for Iman, um, yes, um, uh, taqwa, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرًا um, And therefore, <clears throat> one of the properties of the heart of a mu'min is that it has taqwa. Okay? And, and that taqwa is what protects the Iman, that taqwa is what regulates the Iman, it's that taqwa um, that allows iman to grow, right? Um, Allah says in the Quran, um, you know, um, act, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will ittaqullah wa yuallimkum Allah, right? Have taqwa, and Allah will teach you more. Meaning, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will guide you further. Allah will put more nur into your heart. So it is through the taqwa that we receive more iman from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very important point because uh, <clears throat> just want to reiterate that this iman, you know what Allah, Allah says, Allah guides to his light whomsoever he wills. You know, how does Allah choose whom to guide? Is it, for example, at random? Of course, we know that it is not at random. It is with wisdom. Well, what is that wisdom? Wherever Allah sees the capacity for guidance, there He provides the guidance itself. And that capacity is not just built by reading, by going for courses. That's very important. And we've said it's important to have a structured understanding of our faith because in moments of doubt, it is that becomes our mishkat, that becomes our sadr, that protects our iman, right? Um, but that is not sufficient. What increases our capacity is taqwa. And taqwa, um, if I can just briefly give you a very, um, I think, important definition of what it means to build iman. The taqwa is not just limited to prayers and fasting or not just limited to doing that which is um, wajib and staying away from that which is haram. That is important. It is the building block. And taqwa actually means to live life, to live life, to act, to decide, to move, uh, to talk, to do everything, to dress, to live life um, in accordance to our understanding of Islam, in accordance to Islam, in accordance to the Quran. That is what really builds Iman, that as we live on the basis of what we already know to be true, that is what builds Iman. Ittaqullah, you know, act upon that which you know. Yu'allimkum Allah. Allah will teach you the other things that you need to know. So it's that taqwa, Brother Muhammad, that brings about 
Iman um, within the heart. Can we call the peace and sukun of a mu'min's heart as expansion of the heart? Well, one of the qualities of the expansion of the heart is peace and sukun. You know, expansion of the heart, one of the meanings of it is forbearance, patience. You know, uh, sometimes a person has a very big heart. And so, for example, when you throw insults at that person, it's like throwing pebbles into what? Into a large ocean. The ocean doesn't become tumultuous. It doesn't start shaking up and down, for example. But if you have a small pond or actually a small cup of tea, for example, you have water in there, you throw a pebble in there and everything goes up and down, right? It reacts violently, all right? Um, sharh al-sadr means to have a big heart, meaning a big heart, meaning when somebody throws and hurls insults at you, for example, um, you uh, don't react violently. You're able to absorb it, okay? And you're only able to absorb it because of a sense of sakina, a sense of tranquility, a sense of understanding that is um, within you. So um, <clears throat> one of the results of the expansion of the heart is that it does bring sakina and a sense of peace and tranquility into it as well. All right. Um, well, then we will end our session over here. We hope, inshallah, it has shared light upon the ayah of Noor. And what we have tried to do is to interpret it in light of the words of the Quran itself, in light of um, the meanings that come out of it, the way it would have been clearly understood at the time of revelation and the way it has been understood um, by our scholars so that we can provide ourselves a meaningful understanding of these verses and not just a very uh, vague or, for example, a very superstitious understanding of these verses, but rather a meaningful, inshallah, understanding that helps us um, in our own lives and in making decisions uh, in our lives. Uh, uh, somebody has asked for an email address, so I'm just sharing over here. Please feel free to send me an email if you have any questions about today's session or the previous session. Be more than happy to try and answer it. Um, I'll ask you to be patient, as sometimes it can take me time to answer my emails, but inshallah, I will try to respond in, in good time. Okay, wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.